Evening, everyone. You can page to Judges chapter 10. We'll be studying the first six verses. All right, I'm going to read and then we will jump straight into the passage. Tola and Jeh. After Abimelech, there arose two, there arose to save Israel, Tola, the son of Pua, son of Dodo, a man of Issachar, and he lived at Shamir in the hill country of Ephraim, and he judged Israel 23 years, then he died and was buried at Shamir. After him arose Jeh the Gileadite, who judged Israel 22 years, and he had 30 sons who rode on 30 donkeys, and they had 30 cities called havoth Jeh to this day, which are in the land of Gilead. And Jeh died and was buried in Camon. The people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtaroths, the, God of, the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the Ammonites, the gods of the Philistines, and they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. Let's pray, and then we'll look at this passage. Lord, we pray that as we come to this challenging passage that you would open our eyes to see what you have to say to us. We pray, Lord, that you would guard us from seeing things in the passage that aren't there. And we pray, Lord, that if there are things in the passage that you'd like us to see, that you would bring them out to us. We pray for much grace, Lord. Um, we pray that we would grow spiritually as a result of this exercise, as a result of studying these two judges, as a result of the preaching of your word. We really do pray, Lord, that you would work in our hearts and um, in the process of this means of grace, that you would um, save the lost and that you would edify us as Christians. Amen. Why on earth would the book of Judges include these two judges with seemingly such little detail? Could it be that these two judges serve the function of being a bridge, a bridge between the accounts of Gideon, which we saw from Judges chapter 6 to 9, and the accounts of Jephthah, which we are going to see from Judges chapter 10, verse 6, all the way to chapter 12, verse 7. Now, as far as I'm concerned, that's a resounding yes. Because Tola, the first judge, which we'll look at today, he is connected directly to the account of Abimelech. Because he judged the area affected by Abimelech's actions. And Jer, the second judge we're going to study today, is connected to the narrative that follows, judging in the area that Jephthah would ju one day judge in, after his death. Now, even though these two men may function as a narrative structure, as a bridge between major narratives, that doesn't mean that there's no value in studying these judges. I've labor, labored over these seemingly vague texts for the last two weeks, and you know what? It's actually been a really, it's been a huge blessing. I hope that as I share with you my findings this evening, that you'll also be blessed. In preparation, I listened to sermons, read commentaries, and agonized about how best to approach these two judges. I listened to about three or four sermons, and, and that's a lot, because it is very difficult to find any sermons on these judges. And something that disappointed me as I listened to some of the sermons was some of the preachers used these texts to insert their own thoughts into it. And they used the lack of detail in the text to launch into their soapbox issues. And um, I don't want to do that this evening. 
not wanting to fall into the same trap, and pray that I don't, because it's always a danger for preachers. I thought it would be best to handle the text thematically, as opposed to verse by verse, where the best way to handle it thematically being our already established destructive cycle that Israel found itself in, the, the, the cycle that we pulled out of Judges 2 verse 11 to 23. That's where the template comes out of. Now just to remind you of the cycle, I know it might be repetitive, we might have spoken about it a couple of times, but it's important to know it. It's the cyclical crime, the cyclical punishment, the cyclical response, the cyclical solution or savior, and the cyclical limitations to the solution or savior. Now my prayer is that despite the lack of detail regarding these two judges, we would grow in our knowledge of God's word and that we would grow in our faith. Also be aware that when dealing with such passages, as much as we, we don't like this idea, there is an element to which we need to make educated guesses. But our prayer is that those educated guesses have a firm foundation in Scripture. With those introductory comments out the way, let's begin by observing our first point for this evening, which is the cyclical crime. And this is from Judges 8, verse 27, Judges 8, verse 33, 9, verse 4, and 9, verse 46. Now, we have just spent six weeks looking at Gideon, and Abimelech. We spent four weeks dealing with Gideon himself and two weeks dealing with his son, the aftermath of Gideon's death after that. Now at the end of Judges 8, Gideon dies and Israel returns to their idolatrous ways. You can see that in Judges 8.33. And bear in mind that there had already been hints of idolatry in Judges 8 verse 27. We are reminded in these verses of Gideon's limitations. Firstly, because he caused Israel to embrace idolatrous behavior. How did he do that? By breaking the second commandment. The commandment that emphasizes why it is so important that we worship God the way he tells us to. Now, if you need more information on that, just refer to that sermon. I'm not going to elaborate on that here. And the second reason he was limited as a judge, Gideon, was because he couldn't live forever like the other judges and continually restrain Israel from the idolatry that they so desperately longed to engage in. That they only refrained from out of fear. Now, in chapter 9, we see the aftermath of Gideon's death, which we're going to get to in our next point. But it is worth noting that the people of Shechem gave money to Abimelech from the house of baal Baal Baal-bereth being the false god that Israel turned to after Gideon's death in Judges 8.33. We also see in Judges 9 verse 46 that the people of Shechem sought refuge in their time of need as Abimelech was attacking the city in the stronghold of the house of Elbereth. Elbereth meaning Almighty Bereth or God Bereth. This is, there's idolatry everywhere here. Now, this provides us with a brief application in the form of a question. Who or what do you flee to when things start going badly? Few things reveal what we should be wary of in the context of the things that have the greatest potential of taking the place of God in our lives as the number one priority. Few things reveal that to us more clearly than where you run to when the going gets tough. When things go wrong, do you bury yourself in your work, entertainment, drugs, pornography, or relationships? Or do you flee to the Lord? 
going to leave it at that. Just a question for us to think about. Let's move on to our second point now. Under the heading, the cyclical punishment. Now this is from Judges 9 verse 1 to 10 verse 1. Up to this point, Israel has needed deliverance from external threats. But here we see them needing deliverance from an internal threat. They need deliverance from other Israelites at this point. In Judges 9, we see the rise and fall of the city of Shechem and Abimelech. What started as an alliance between two parties, Abimelech and the leaders of Shechem, with similar murderous goals, ended with those parties turning on one another. And the results of this Israelite disunity were nothing short of brutal. Let me summarize chapter 9, because we had sermons on it. Chapter 9 ended with Gideon's 70 sons murdered, bar one. The city of Shechem destroyed. The inhabitants of Shechem and their leaders all killed. Abimelech, who wrongfully became the king of Shechem, with nobody to rule with. Why? Because he killed them all. And Abimelech's death when attacking Tebez in a blind rage. Israel didn't need deliverance from the Philistines, the Moabites, or the Ammonites. They needed deliverance from themselves. That's the difference here. This is the change you've got to see that's happening in this book. Before this, they needed deliverance from foreign powers. Now, who do they need deliverance from? In Judges 10 verse 1, we read a short phrase, but it's packed with meaning. After Abimelech. Just leave it at that. After Abimelech. Israel no longer needed deliverance from Cushan, Rishathaim, or Eglon, foreign rulers mentioned in Judges chapter 3. They needed deliverance from their own leaders, from themselves. Abimelech may, be, may have been the poster boy and the ultimate embodiment of what Israel needed deliverance from here, but the leaders of Shechem and power-hungry Gaal were just as big a problem. And as a culture post-Gideon, as we saw with the temple of Alberia um, and the, 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 the tower, the stronghold of the tower of Alberith, in this territory of Shechem, where chapter 9 is centered, they were godless. They were as godless as any foreign nation. So what did God do to this godless culture? He took away his protective power and allowed an evil spirit to cause conflict between their selfish and godless leaders. See Judges 9.23. And God used the wicked to judge the wicked, which includes those who followed these godless leaders. And the country was destabilized. It fell apart. Anarchy reigned. That's one of the major themes in this book. Take God out of a situation, anarchy will reign. Men will do whatever they want to do. They need a king to tell them what to do. Israel needed a leader to rebuild. And that's our fourth point. We'll get there in a bit. Just something to keep our eye on as we work our way through the book. Observe as we make our way through the book the correlation between Israel's increasing abandonment of God and the resulting disunity in the nation. Godless people can work together well. For a while, if their ambitions are aligned, we saw this previously as we studied Abimelech and Shechem. But in the long run, disunity will rear its ugly head when they no longer want the same thing. Let me take this opportunity to just warn against an extreme version of the ecumenical or church unity movement, talking about a desire to unite. Christendom, let's call it Christendom, 
at all costs, I won't say Christianity, because most of it's not real Christianity. We as a church can happily work with Grace Presbyterian, which is another denomination. That's an example of church unity. Why can we work with Grace Presbyterian? Because they share our gospel. We preach the same gospel. And both churches are Christ-centered. But if we align ourselves with churches that hold to a different gospel, like universalism, a liberal church, or making the gospel about getting wealthier, a word faith church, or a cult like the Mormons or the Jehovah's Witnesses, then we've got a problem. And if we are man-centered, focused more on, on uh, we, and if we join and we work with churches that are man-centered, churches that are focused more on letting sinful man dictate their actions, as opposed to God and His Word, you know what? We're playing a dangerous game. We have to be aligned on the principles given to us in Scripture. A lack of unity, yes, is something, is a sign that something is wrong in the life of the church. That is what has resulted in this church unity movement to a large degree. It's a good desire to see all, this, all these churches, all the division in the church, see it disappear. God desires unity in the church. It's a sign of lack of health. Let's acknowledge that. But a willingness to indiscriminately work with anybody. The likes of Abimelech, like Abimelech and the leaders of Shechem did. Let me tell you, that's an equally scary sign. It's like a pendulum swing. Uniting with everybody is one major problem. And on the other side, if you pendulum swing, uniting with nobody is another sign of a major problem. Be very careful of both of those extremes. Let's move on to our next point. The cyclical response. This will be very brief. Now, as we have seen in our previous accounts in Judges, namely Judges 3 verse 9, 15, 4 verse 3, and 6, chapter 6 verse 6 to 7, Israel cried, cried out to the Lord during their times of judgment. But here we see no such detail. There may be one of two reasons for that. Firstly, the writer may simply have been seeking to be brief and omitted the details of the response of Israel to their suffering. Or secondly, it may be that Israel's heart had become so hard that they no longer called out to the Lord when the going got tough. In my opinion, the first option makes more sense when considering that in Judges 10 verse 10, Israel was still in the practice of crying out to the Lord for deliverance. And considering the account of the judges referred to, these kind of judges are referred to as the minor judges, they didn't usually include such details when dealing with the minor judges. So Israel at this point probably did cry out to the Lord. Sadly, when we get to Samson, one of the major judges, the, the final judge, this detail will be excluded from the account. And that's significant. Sometimes you can learn a lot from what's omitted. And in this case, it is very significant that nothing is mentioned in the account of Samson. But we'll get there. Let's now observe how God responded to sinful Israel. They needed to be saved, not from a foreign power, but from themselves. 
from their own. The cyclical solutions or saviors. Judges 10 verse 1 to 4. Now, in verse 1 to 2 we read the following. After Abimelech. We've already seen the importance of that short phrase. They arose to save Israel, Tola, the son of Puah, son of Dodo, a man of Issachar, and he lived at Shamir in the hill country of Ephraim. And he judged Israel 23 years. And in verses 3 and 4, we read the following. After him, meaning after Tola, arose Jer, the Gileadite, who judged Israel 22 years. And he had 30 sons who rode on 30 donkeys, and they had 30 cities called Havoth Jer to this day, which are in the land of Gilead. What do we know about these two judges? Let's start with Tola. Names are meaningful in the Bible, and his name meant worm or maggot. <laughs> no, it's not the best name, but it's actually, uh, it was a name of great distinction, as you'll see. The root word of this name describes a specific kind of maggot that was scarlet in color. The root word for this name, th this name comes out from a specific root word. Now the root word for this name is often translated as scarlet or worm in the King James Version. So they, they are interchangeable, the color and the worm itself. Now, we also know that Tola may have come from a very important family of Issachar. The tribe, his tribe, with Tola, must have been, Tola, that name Tola in Issachar was a very important name. It was most likely the name that was passed down to those earmarked as a future leader. We know that in, in certain circles, certain prominent families, a firstborn is often called junior. They take the father's name. There's a real sense in which junior is going to be the one who's going to take over from dad one day. It's a sign that this person has been earmarked as the future leader. Now you can see about this family in Genesis 46 verse 13. This family is spoken of. And the Tola in Genesis 46 verse 13 is clearly not the Tola here. Otherwise he'd be ancient. He's from the same tribe though. It is significant that in Numbers 26 verse 23. This is a bit later on in the narrative of Israel that the Tolaites are a well-known family in Scripture. They, this family may well have been the first family of Issachar. Like in the U.S., they've got the Kennedys. If you're a Kennedy, you walk and say, I'm a Kennedy, and everyone just pulls out the red carpet. Go! It is also worth noting about this man, Tola, and about his family, that in 1 Chronicles 7 verse 2, this family is described in the following way, mighty warriors of their generations. This description very well may include Tola, spoken of in our passage for today, because that was written post-Tola. The Numbers passage was written before Tola, or the one we're speaking about now. Now, Despite coming from Issachar, this Tola decided to live in the hill country of Ephraim, a different tribe. Meaning, first of all, that he most likely ruled over several of the tribes, two or three of them at the time. Which would have included the area negatively affected by the conflict between Abimelech and the leaders of Shechem. In fact, it says that Tola lived in an area called Shamir. And he was buried there. The fact that he was buried there shows that Shamir was a precious place to him. Despite him coming from a different tribe. 
It is also significant that Shamir, according to Bible maps, was very close to Shechem, meaning that this man lived in the area that was so badly affected by Abimelech. The area that Abimelech destroyed. Could he possibly have saved Israel by using his influence to help rebuild after Abimelech destroyed? Let's leave Tola now. Let's move on to the other judge who judged Israel for 20, well, we, Tola judged Israel for 23 years. Je judged Israel for 22. Let's see what we know about Je. Remembering that names are significant, the name Je means enlightener. He was raised up by God after Tola had already started judging Israel. Now, we can't be sure if he started judging during Tola's lifetime, or if he only started judging after Tola had died already. That's unclear. It's not important, necessarily. It is possible that they judged Israel at the same time, because the two of them judged in completely different areas. He also most likely came from a very significant family in Gilead, which usually describes any land east of the Jordan. So, let me just give you a bit of a geography lesson here. Israel came from Egypt. They went to the southern part of Israel. They sinned. They sent the 12 spies in. 12 of them said, nah, the place is horrible. God judged them and said, you're going to wander around for 40 years. They went up around the other side to the eastern side of, the, of, of Israel. They got attacked by two nations defeated them, God said, hey guys, take the land. Israel, you can have this section of land. Some tribes decided to settle there. They asked, can we settle this side on the eastern side, even though the promised land is over the Jordan River, on the western side of the river? Okay? So what I'm talking about is that section on the eastern side of the Jordan River. That section that wasn't initially considered the promised land. And let me just go back here. He, that, so that usually describes the land east of the Jordan River. And Manasseh, the tribe that occupied this area, which is known as Eastern Manasseh, Manasseh had land both, both on the eastern side of the Jordan and on the western side of the Jordan. But this guy... Je came from eastern Manasseh. Now, in Numbers 32, verse 41, Deuteronomy 3, verse 14, and Joshua 13, verse 30, we are told of a Je, not the same one, not the one in our account for today, but probably a forefather of him that conquered many cities east of the Jordan. He conquered 60 cities. And he named that area that he conquered after himself. He named it Havoth Jair. So Jair was most likely a member of Gilead's first family. And the fact that he had the family name meant that he was most likely their most prominent leader as well. We see in Judges 10 verse 4 that Jair ruled over 30 cities, which shows the decline of his tribe's power in that region. Havoth Je going from 60 cities that they controlled down to 30 cities. That's a decline. The fact that he had 30 sons does show that Je most likely had more than one wife, which was a sign of wealth. A fact confirmed by his 30 sons ruling over these 30 cities, and that they all rode on donkeys, another sign of wealth or power at the time. Remember that when Jesus came into Jerusalem on a donkey, that was an action fitting of royalty. Donkeys 
in the Bible didn't represent, oh, shame, man, they couldn't get a horse, they got a donkey. No, it was a sign of royalty. It was actually a high honor to ride a donkey. And you want to see the significance of a donkey, go to Matthew 21, verse 1 to 11, and Zechariah 9, verse 9. Now, based on all that information, what can we say about these two judges? This is how we have to make our way through this text. Firstly, we can say that both of them came from powerful and significant families, which probably resulted in them taking up positions of leadership. Secondly, we know that when both of them led in Israel, in their respective areas, they were either in a total mess after Abimelech had his way, or in decline, with the total number of cities in Havothje decreasing from 60 to 30. And thirdly, we see that they seem to have, they seem to have saved Israel through rebuilding their respective areas as opposed to fighting foreign powers, as we have seen already. Most of the judges we've observed have had to fight foreign powers. They've had to like, go into these battles where the odds were completely against them and win them. Here it seems these guys seem to save Israel administratively through a rebuilding process, almost at a in a political process. Here we see two men that came to power because of their family, using their privilege for the glory of God. Sometimes we view heroes as, as protesters or fighters that speak truth to power, as many wannabe revolutionaries would put it. And let me tell you, that little phrase, Speaking truth to power has become a motto for people today. Believing that all power is evil and those who are weaker need to speak you truth to power. Basically saying the people in power should keep quiet and just listen. But here we see two men granted power by God's grace and what do they do with their power? They use it to build their country up as opposed to exploit it. Two applications out of this. Firstly, if God has placed you in a position of power, even over something that is dwindling or dying, seek to use that power to lead righteously. Don't use your power to oppress those weaker than you, but see it as an opportunity to serve those under your leadership and emulate Jesus. Jesus said in Matthew 20, verse 25 to 28, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles, who came to be rulers through their family connection, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their great ones exercised authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The second application is that power isn't a bad thing. It only becomes bad when it is abused. We live in a culture that is saturated in Marxist thought. And the idea that power is bad and that power always needs to be overthrown or that power was always gained through sinful means. This, is, this isn't a biblical idea. Because in our passage for today, we see two men that use their power for good just like Jesus did. And we see this principle clearly taught that the government is not necessarily a bad thing. People in power not necessarily a bad thing. We see this principle clearly taught in Romans 13, verse 1 to 7. Don't go trying to overthrow the government. Be a good citizen. That God 
put the government there to be a blessing. Yes, we know of many political leaders that abuse it. That wasn't initially God's plan. And that's not always the case. With those two brief applications, let's move on to our final point. And the cyclical limitations to the solution or Savior. Judges 10 verse 2 and verses 5 to 6. In our passage, we see these men's limitations and that they could only judge over Israel for a combined 45 years. And then they died. This is the case with every single one of these judges. And isn't it glorious that the ultimate judge rose from the dead? What happened after these two men died in verse 6? We read the following. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. They served the Baals and the Ashtoreths and the gods of Aram, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the Ammonites, and the gods of the Philistines. As much as these men saved Israel from themselves for 45 years, it was temporary. As we have seen throughout this series, Israel ultimately needs, they don't ultimately need a masterful politician to build the country up and encourage them to obey the Lord, to argue about why it's a good thing to embrace Christian morals. What they needed was God to change their hearts from stubborn hearts of stone to responsive hearts of flesh and to give them the person of the Holy Spirit to control that responsive heart so that they would obey God's word from a willing heart. We'll see that in Ezekiel 36 as I use that as the doxology. The world may be in a mess and godly leaders may make it a bit more bearable. But things will never ultimately change until individuals stop serving themselves and doing whatever they please and start worshipping Jesus instead. And they start obeying Him with a willing heart. We need more than social reform. We need revival. And we should pray for it. We don't need powerful men to lead us. We need a miracle, talking about the miracle of regeneration, God taking a godless person who wants nothing to do with them and then overnight changing them, making them a completely different person. And we need people passionately following Jesus. Perhaps you have been convicted tonight that you are no different to these Israelites that returned to their idolatry as soon as their godly judge died. And because of that, you have come to fear the judgment that is coming your way. If that is the case, take heart. God may be in the process of saving you, but how are you going to respond to your guilt? Respond to this guilt and fear by confessing your sin to Jesus for your idolatry, for doing whatever you wanted and not caring about how he wants you to live. And beg him, the ultimate judge, the judge who rose from the dead to save you from yourself and your deserved coming judgment. Let's pray. Lord, we, we just want to thank you for your word. We want to thank you that um, even though at times we all read passages like this and they seem so vague, Lord, that we have so many other exa- uh, areas in Scripture. We have um, passages that shed light on these vague passages and, and help us to understand them better. We thank you for that, Lord. We pray, Lord, that as we have studied this passage, that we would, we would grow spiritually. 
that we wouldn't read into it. Um, these are difficult passages. We pray, Lord, that you may make us faithful interpreters of your word and that we would eat the meat and spit out the bones. Lord, please, as we consider this, this idea of privilege and power, there's a sense in which us as Christians, we are more privileged than anyone out there in the world. We have this world view. We think clearly. We have your word. Lord, may we use those privileges and that power for your glory and not for our selfish ambitions. And please, Lord, if anyone is sitting here this evening who does not know you as their Lord and Savior, if there's someone sitting here who has heard this and looked at themselves and thought, man, I'm just like those Israelites. The moment uh, this... The moment my parents stop telling me what to do, I'm just going to let loose. I'm no different to them. Lord, please convict them of their sin and cause them to turn to you. We beg you, Lord. Amen. All right, we're going to sing Purify My Heart and then I'll...